I know we got behind today this morning, so I appreciate we trying to catch back up. Um, before uh, we introduce the next speaker, I just wanted to say a couple things. One, I wanted to say thank you again to everyone. I hope it's been a really good week. We're, this is our closing keynote. Um, still got some training sessions after. Um, I wanted to say a special thank you to Ayumi Bennett. Um, so if you don't know Ayumi, she's over here making all these posters. <laughs> so we're glad to have a Ayumi back. Um, she had a baby last year, so she couldn't be with us. Um, and then she was surprised to come and find that all these things up here, there were things she drew two years ago at Intersect. So uh, it's kind of cool. So she actually helped decorate the place. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and also, I don't know if you, any of you guys were, saw the video or the music that was playing as you were coming in earlier. Uh, that was actually uh, Gopinia's band uh, from uh, VDOT Richmond District uh, playing a, a Jeff Beck cover. So that was Gil on drums, by the way. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> so I'll let Justin, yeah. I'm going to let Justin introduce our next speaker. How we doing? Everybody live? Awake? There's some candy bars. You guys get some candy and sugar before? All right, 2 o'clock almost, or 1 o'clock then too, right? Uh, I got the pleasure. My name is Justin Cox. I've got the pleasure of introducing Malcolm Doherty, our next speaker. Uh, Malcolm is the Senior Vice President and National Practice Lead for, of Transportation for Michael Baker International. He is responsible for driving the strategic direction, growth, and performance of the practice and leads an integrated team of regional transportation and management professionals in all aspects of transportation. Malcolm brings more than 25 years of transportation industry experience to our stage. And while at the uh, California Department of Transportation, he held roles of increasing responsibility that accumulated to his most recent position as director. In this role, he was responsible for the maintenance and operation of more than 50,000 lane miles of roadway and a state highway system, uh, uh, of the state highway system, and the delivery of a $11 billion construction portfolio. He has also uh, had the overall fiscal responsibility for the department budget of more than 10 billion and 20,000 employees. Malcolm holds numerous affiliations and certifications in the transportation industry and is a licensed professional engineer in California. Now that we've embarrassed him, let's welcome uh, Malcolm to the stage. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I understand you're at the tail end of uh, three intense days, and then I have the uh, envious slot of right after lunch. So uh, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to bore you with a PowerPoint. I'm going to bore you with uh, with uh, just uh, my voice. Um, Hopefully I can uh, give a little bit of tidbits of information, and I want to try to give a couple of different uh, specific examples of what's going on, and these are all hot topics for me that I've talked about just in the last three or four weeks. But let me expand just a little bit on my background. Justin did a pretty good job. Uh, was worked at the California Department of Transportation for 26 years, and about a year and a half ago moved over to Michael Baker International. I got really involved in uh, ITS activities and connected and autonomous vehicles in my role in, uh, at Caltrans in California because California was moving forward with trying to set policies and there was a lot of activity going on with uh, the development of autonomous vehicles. And just to put it in context, today there are over 60 companies, six zero companies with permits to test autonomous vehicles on public roads in California. That's with a, uh, a um, safety driver behind the wheel. There's one company with a permit to test uh, autonomous vehicles on public roads without a safety driver behind the wheel in California. So there's a lot of activity. Uh, I certainly believe that between connected uh, or autonomous vehicles, you also need to add the aspect of connected technology. And I'll talk a little bit about that because I think the two of them augment each other and you're not going to realize the benefits of uh, all the technology until you do. Um, it's, it was odd looking at the caricatures outside of people I know and, and spoke earlier this week, some of them very close friends of mine, and I was looking at the boards to see some of the uh, uh, notes and comments that they made, and maybe I'll even reinforce some of them or maybe even contradict them. And by the way, I want to try to leave uh, time for questions uh, towards the end because that's really the best part to see um, you know, where all this information comes together for you, and then we, uh, and we can talk about it. 
three things that I want to talk about is a little bit about timing. When are we going to see what? And I like to talk about this. I've had several different panels where I've been asked uh, amongst other panels, and then I've moderated a panel where I asked uh, five different testers of autonomous vehicles what time frame that they thought uh, what was going to be developed and deployed. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I do want to talk about the current uh, discussion about uh, connected technology and what the uh, two competing um, technologies that are out there and what I uh, see coming out of those. And then I want to give a couple of real life examples of what uh, we're working through in my current job um, at Michael Baker International and working for clients on, on some things and how we may work through those issues because it may be applicable to some of the things I say, but it also may be applicable to um, some other things that uh, you've encountered uh, through the classes, even uh, some of the other keynotes. So when do we think we're going to see what? I, I, I usually tell people some of this stuff is going to take uh, a lot longer than, you, than, than, there, than is advertised that are some people are talking about. But on the flip side of that, some of this stuff's going to come sooner than, than a lot of people think. Things that you're going to see right away and maybe even see now is three-dimensional cruise control um, on freeways. You know, not only adaptive cruise control, but then following the lane lines uh, GM or Cadillac is putting out under GM. Um, super Cruise Control, Tesla's got the autopilot. I don't know that I would call it autopilot, but that's what they call it. Um, and that's going to become more and more common. I drive a Honda, and that Honda, if I let it, would drive down the freeway following the lane lines and following the car in front of it. But I can tell you this, it's not something I can rely on. It's a backup system. It's an assist system, and that's most of the technology. But real quick, in the very near future, I think that'll be more normal for three-dimensional cruise control to be active in cars. So that's one of the early things you'll see. The other thing that's ready technology is lower speed, completely autonomous shuttles. Um, I, could, I wouldn't necessarily see that. I took a, uh, an Uber between the airport and here. I, w I don't know that I would see that go doing that route, but on the University of Tennessee campus shuttling students around, yeah, that, that technology is ready, and I think that'll become a lot more prevalent. It's in between those two scenarios that's going to get messy over the next couple of years or next decade. Um, when is it? And th I was asked this question uh, on a panel, and they said, when will I be able to go outside and call up an Uber and the Uber shows up without a driver, get into it, and it takes me to my destination? And as they worked down the line, I realized I was going to be the pessimist on this panel when I answered this question, because almost to a person, as we worked down, the, and that was the secretary of PennDOT, it was the director of the Colorado DOT, uh, and the Michigan DOT, and Michigan is doing a lot of stuff along with California on connected and autonomous vehicles. This is two years ago, and they all said two to three years. Uh, and I said, look, I'm going to be the pessimist. I really don't think that that's going to be uh, available to us for about a decade. Uh, now, I think you'll see it popping up in certain geofenced areas in um, controlled environments um, in major metropolitan areas as a demonstration. Uber is running around in Pittsburgh using autonomous vehicles with a safety driver behind it, but that's a little ways away. I told this story uh, in Washington, D.C. at the uh, ITS America uh, board meeting, and I actually have sat on the ITS America board and is, uh, am the chair of the executive committee this year. When I took a, a, an Uber there from the airport to downtown Washington, D.C. at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, let me tell you, it's a long time before an autonomous vehicle can do what my Uber driver did to get me downtown. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I mean, the way it navigated traffic and navigated queues, and then when it got downtown and navigated the buses and navigated pedestrians and people on scooters, we're a little ways away from, from uh, an Uber vehicle or a Lyft or any autonomous vehicle making that trek the way that, guy, uh, the way that individual did. Otherwise, it'll take us three days to do it because it's going to inch along with, this, with so many dynamics that are going on. So I, I'm a, I just think that's going to take a little bit longer. Um, the other dynamic, and I actually saw Randy Iwasaki, he probably kicked this meeting off on Tuesday. I know Randy uh, very, very well, good friend of mine. He was the Caltrans director a couple of years before I was the Caltrans director. Randy likes to talk about this. Look, there's, it's going to be a huge uh, uh, improvement on safety factors. There's no doubt about that. It has the uh, uh, potential to really add um, um, greater access to a lot of different individuals and things like that. Randy likes to talk about it as being um, a, a solution to congestion, and this is where he and I differ a little bit, because those cars are going to be a lot more conservative than we as human drivers are. They're not going to drive closer together when they come out. They're going to drive farther apart, because that car is going to be programmed to give more space, not less space. So if we can cram 1,800 to 2,000 vehicles into a lane, a travel lane, in every hour right now, 
the notion that we're going to cram 4,000 or 4,500 cars in an individual lane, we're, we're a long ways from that. And, and the main reason is, is the only way you're going to do that, you have to have 100% saturation. Those cars all have to have that technology, and not only the autonomous technology, but the connected technology. They need to be talking to each other, as well as have, you know, the adaptive cruise control and looking around them and following the lane lines. They've got to be talking to each other. So we're a long ways. We're going to have a mixed fleet for a long time before you get to 100% saturation to be able to go at high speed closely together with autonomous vehicles. And actually what conversation it's going to provoke at some point is autonomous vehicle lanes because that's the only way you'll be able to do it and you'll have to separate them. But anyway, I think that's kind of the timing and what we'll see. It's the middle part as that gap closes. We'll see the slow speed autonomous shuttles. They're already starting to roll out. The cars will get smarter and smarter, the 3D cruise control, and then the middle's going to start to fill in. But I will tell you this, it's gonna be a mixed fleet and you're gonna have a lot of human driven cars before, uh, along with the autonomous vehicles. And I think you'll start to see them in major metropolitan areas before we see them anywhere else. Another aspect of this is the connected technology, and there's actually a big debate between two technologies right now, one being DSRC, direct short-range communications, and then 5G. So we always hear about 5G on the, uh, on the TV, and the uh, telecommunications folks are talking about 5G. That's just a higher bandwidth for all of our phones, the Internet of Things, everything's going to be talking to each other and those types of things. That's true, but the next level technology, which they also refer to as 5G, and it's a nuanced difference, is that direct between you and me, my phone to your phone, or that direct communication using that 5G bandwidth between car to car not going to the tower, not going to a satellite and coming back down. That technology is still being developed, right? But it's going to be important for cars to talk to cars, cars to talk to signals, cars to talk to infrastructure as all this technology moves forward. Now the rub is this. There's a 5.9 gigahertz, and maybe somebody talked about that bandwidth that's being preserved for connected technology for automotives and uh, automobiles. It's really important we protect that because whatever takes up that band, we're going to use it for safety, safety applications to save lives and, and um, uh, reduce injuries and reduce crashes. Right now, DSRC is using that bandwidth. There's seven channels in there. Uh, 5G, CV to X, uh, connected vehicle to everything else they want to enter into that bandwidth. Well, they're going to have to muscle DSRC out of a couple of the channels. There's seven channels. DSRC is not real happy about that. So now you've got competing interests, competing technologies, and they're applying for a waiver right now. Um, all of us in the industry want to see both technologies advance so that we can see which one wins out in the end and has the better functionality and all those things. But the DSRC is being deployed. It's already deployed. It's a proven technology. We know it works today. They don't want to be muscled out of the channels while, while the CV to X or 5G starts to come in and say, we just want the top two channels. And next year we'll come and ask for the next two channels. And next year we'll come and ask for the next two channels. Somehow we've got to figure out how both technologies can advance. We can see which one wins out. The market will play out and see which one um, is the, has the better functionality and has the uh, better application for safety features and things like that. Um, but uh, we've got to figure out how to do that without to the detriment of uh, other ones. And that's something that's being debated right now because Qualcomm and... Ford want to deploy 5G CV to X in their, in their fleet starting in 2022 or 2023. Well, meanwhile, Toyota is putting DSRC in all their fleet starting in 2021 or 2022. All right, well, if you're an, if you're a, uh, if you're an owner operator in the room, what do you put in your signals, right? If you want the cars to talk to your signals, now we've got to figure out, you know, Ford's going in one area, Toyota's going in another area as an owner-operator. What do I put in the signal cabinets? Both? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm just throwing it out there. But that's a current activity that's going on right now. The connected technology is going to be very, very important. Um, and it's going to really uh, 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 maximize the, uh, uh, the safety uh, capabilities of the new technology with the connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm actually going to the ITS uh, World Congress, which is in uh, Singapore, of all places. I've never been there. We'll see how that goes. But I'm on a, uh, I'm on a panel. I'm a, uh, moderating a panel. Or actually, I'm on a panel for uh, autonomous vehicles in public transportation. So this is another specific application that is a current event right now because I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to say at that. 
such that we achieve the intended consequences, the goals that we want to achieve and not the unintended consequences? How does it augment tra public transportation? How does public transportation start to become the connected autonomous vehicle? Uh, how do we maybe use it as a feeder system, the last mile, first mile, last mile, to bring folks to it? Uh, Randy Iwasaki probably talked about that because he's doing that in Contra Costa County. He's trying to figure out how to use autonomous shuttles to shuttle people from their doorstep to the BART stations and then feed them into the major metropolitan area. He's probably a step ahead most people in developing that and getting permission for doing that. Um, and I think he's going to drive, and, and Contra Costa County and GoMentum Station are going to drive a lot of other folks uh, to do that. But it was very interesting when I was on the prep call for that. Two things came up. One, that's the technology. We just talked about the technology. You've probably been talking about different technology all week. But then there's the other, there's the other, the human the factor of it. And uh, some of the line of questioning on this panel is going to go down the human factor of it. Is everybody willing to get into an autonomous shuttle? The door closes and it starts driving, and there's nobody else in there but you and your two kids and two uh, two neighbors, and you're headed to the BART station. Are you going to trust it? That's an interesting question, right? I've used some of the technology, but there's always a safety driver over there, and as I see it, I build a little confidence. But, you know, your, your average person has no idea what they're in for. Are they willing to get in there, shut the door, and then uh, is that thing going to be on a dedicated right away, or is it going to be driving down Main Street to get to the BART station while other human-driven cars are zipping around it? And, and uh, you know, I, you know the, the human factor and the receptiveness of it, that's an open-ended question. The other thing somebody said on that, uh, on that call was, and it was very interesting because I didn't necessarily think of it this way, was the success of AV deployment when it comes to transit came down to three factors. One was the technology of the vehicle. The vehicle has to be there. The technology in the vehicle has to be there. The other was the infrastructure. The infrastructure has to be receptive to it and make it easy for that thing to navigate. I talked about a dedicated right away, but I don't know that that would necessarily uh, be... be um, uh, available to most situations. And then they said the third factor was the management of the system and how you deployed the system. And he actually broke it down. He thought it was 40-40-20. 40% of this depended on the technology being there. 40% of it depended on the infrastructure being ready for it. And 20% depended on how you deployed it, where you deployed it, and how you managed that system. And I thought that that was very interesting. I didn't write the guy's name down, so I can't credit him for that, but I did get this from this panel and, and in preparation. So that'll, that'll generate a very interesting conversation. Um, but again, the problem we have to figure out in the major metropolitan areas is how to move people in mass. The last thing we need to do is put a, a, a bunch of people in uh, autonomous vehicles and take them off of subways and buses because that's a problem. As a former owner operator in the state of California with San Francisco, with Los Angeles, with San Diego, uh, the biggest problem we had during rush hours is the single occupancy vehicle. The last thing we need is a bunch of zero occupancy vehicles running around going to pick up one person in between, right? So that's one of the unintended consequences is, um, is additional vehicle miles traveled, in increased congestion and things like that. It's going to change the paradigm with parking and all of those other things, and I think some other people spoke to that. Um, but that's going to be, that's a second thing that uh, we're looking at is how to apply the technology. See, and let me, let me stop on that point. I, I've had so many conversations about all the different technologies that's, uh, that are available to go out there, and everybody just wants to deploy it. Everybody just wants to be out there, and they hear about it, and they want to move. Cities want to move. Counties want to move. States want to move. I always go back to what problem are you solving, and then let's use what technology is available to us to solve that problem. Why don't we stop start at the basics? Are we worried about intersection safety? Are we worried about congestion? Are we worried about first mile, last mile? Let's start with that and then use the technology that's available to us today, and more and more of it will be available to us tomorrow to solve that transportation problem. And then it starts to um, become a little clearer what we can do and what we can't do as opposed to just deploying technology um, uh, to, to deploy technology. Uh, another story, if not an example I will give, is um, at the Los Angeles airport. Who's ever flown in or out of LAX? All right, that's a good number of you. Now, if you're just connecting in and out of LAX, it's not that big of a deal. But if you actually have to get out and go somewhere from LAX or come back to LAX, it's a, it's a zoo. Um, a couple of years ago, they let uh, Uber and Lyft into what we call the horseshoe. And if you've ever gone through there, before they did this, it, it took you just after you got to the terminals, it took you 20 to 25 minutes to get through the horseshoe and get out of there. Well, when they allowed Uber and Lyft, and that's the way things are going, that's the trends, when they allowed Uber and Lyft and the shared mobility to have access to the, uh, to the gates, 
it added 15,000 car trips a day. So that's a problem. That's an unintended consequence. It didn't make things better. It made things worse. Now, it made things better to me because I use Uber and Lyft. It was really convenient. And now I didn't have to get in a super shuttle and risk being the 15th person out of that thing for 35 bucks when I could take an Uber for probably 36 bucks and go door to door. But the problem is, is they broke down that transportation. I mean, it's hard enough even to get to LAX, and now LAX was just, it was just um, uh, devastated by all these additional vehicles that are in there. Just last week, they announced they're taking not only the shared mobility, the TNCs as we call them, Uber and Lyfts, and the taxis. If you want to catch a taxi and an Uber and Lyft, they're taking them out of the horseshoe and they're taking them to a designated spot to be able to have to access them. Uh, several other airports have done this where you've got to walk a half a mile to get your Uber or Lyft. Well, they're going to do the same thing. At, I don't think it's going to be that far, but you're going, to move those, uh, you're going to move that pickup spot. You'll still be able to drop off, but they're going to move the pickup spot. They estimate that that's going to save, reduce traffic into the, into the horseshoe, as we call it, by 23%. Now, the reason I tell you that story is it's not going to get better when we add autonomous vehicles to the whole mix, right? So, you, I mean, the autonomous vehicles, it's going to be making all of those things even more convenient, but we're going to have to figure out how to put rails on this and set some policies such that we're not breaking down the transportation system, we're solving solutions and we're improving the transportation system. Now, right now you can take a shuttle from the curb to that designated area or you can walk. It's next to Terminal 1 if you're close to Terminal 1, blah, 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 but you can walk. Not everybody's going to be in a situation where they want to walk or can walk. Here's another application now that they've had to take that measure where you could use autonomous shuttles to move people there. Now you're just picking people up in groups. You stop at every terminal, you get 15, 20 people, you take them over there. Now the individual disbursement using Uber and Lyfts and taxis are out of that mix and in a more designated area where it's more uh, taken care of. So that's an application of the technology that can do it. I bring this up also, again, here we go with the intended consequences and the unintended consequences. They wanted to add the access and the convenience and the uh, mobility improvements of the shared mobility, but when they did it, it crashed the whole transportation system at the uh, LA airport. Um, and this is, gonna be, this is going to be translatable to major metropolitan areas. Um, it's, it's really difficult to get into downtown New York. It's really difficult to get into downtown San Francisco. We just can't open it up to y autonomous vehicles because they, we barely get um, you know, single occupancy vehicles uh, in, in and out of those places. But that's a way that they could do it and improve um, uh, traffic in that area by 23%. And technology is only going to improve their ability to try to figure out how to get people um, in and out of there. All right, so one other example, and this gets into a little bit of a, a technology where all of you have a greater, a greater knowledge base on the, the, the technical side of these things. Um, but uh, this is one other example that we're working with on Interstate 15 in between Riverside and San Bernardino County. And Riverside County is doing a widening on I-15 and it's going to be a hot lane. So you can have HOV folks in there as well as toll payers in there. Riverside County's right behind them. They're doing the design. They're going to build their connection right after Riverside County does. But if you're the consumer, if you're the motoring public, you're just on I-15. You don't know whether or not you're in Riverside County or in San Bernardino County, and the way it works in California, Riverside County RCTC is actually collecting tolls on that section of it, and San Bernardino County SBCTA is collecting tolls on the I-15 segment in, the, in that county. But they've got to make it seamless, right? The signing should be seamless, the toll collection should be seamless. You shouldn't even notice that you're driving in between counties if you're using the express lanes on your commute or wherever you're going. Now, here's the, here's the dilemma. From a policy standpoint, Riverside County has said we're only using transponders to collect tolls and we're going to charge for HOVs of 2 plus and 3 plus. It's going to be a reduced rate, we'll give them a 50 percent break, but they're not going to be free. Well San Bernardino County and the SBCTA, the County Transportation Authority, they had a different policy. Their policy was we're going to keep it open as to how we collect tolls. We're going to use the transponder. We're also going to use an ability to pay online using uh, license plate reader systems. You can go online after the fact and pay that toll. Or we're going to use the stickers, the 6C stickers. And they want to keep the 3 plus HOV free. All right, well, this is all good unless you're the individual driving on I-15. If you're driving from Riverside County, you're going to have a transponder. That was required to get into the express lane. 
then when you get into San Bernardino County, everything's fine. You still have a transponder. But if you're driving from San Bernardino County on I-15 and you're going to go into Riverside County and you're using the sticker, the hot lane, the express lane in Riverside County isn't using the sticker technology. Right? Now, this is one of the dilemmas that California has because they've kind of broken up some of their management of the hot lanes and it's not, it's not uniform across the state. But they've got to figure that out and they've got to figure technology out because otherwise, if you're driving on Interstate 15 and you get to Riverside County line, if they don't figure this out, they're going to have to put a sign up that says, all you stickers and license plate payers, get out. <laughs> and if you've got a transponder, you can stay in. That's not going to work. That's not going to be acceptable. So what we're bringing to the table is we're doing that. We're a typical A&E firm, but we do have a lot of expertise on the, on the CAV side. I bring a lot of that to the table from my prior job, and we also have an individual who concentrates on just CAV technology who we hired from Michigan DOT, so he has a lot of knowledge about connected and autonomous vehicles as well. We're going to not necessarily make the policy decision for them, but besides the A&E, the design of the highway and that type of, sis, that type of stuff, and as well as the um, toll collecting system, we're going to inform them of everything that's possible, the art of possible, the full spectrum of technology that's available to them, and, and give them some policy advice so that they can help make some policy decisions. Now, one of the things that is good is I actually know the executive director of both of them. They used to be Caltrans district directors in that local district when I was a district director and ultimately the director, so I know them very well. But those are their decisions, but they've got to figure this out. And how can technology... Uh, and, and, and all the different uh, capabilities that we have today help them make that decision and, and bridge this gap. Some of it's just policy, and maybe you are free in Riverside County or uh, San Bernardino County if you've got three people in the car, and maybe when you get into Riverside County, they're going to charge you 50 cents instead of a dollar. That may go, but you've got to figure out how the toll collection is going to work. And the other piece of technology that is emerging but not there yet, if you ask me, others may say we're there, is... So if you're collecting a toll and you're collecting $1 if it's just you and you're collecting 50 cents if there's three of you in the car, how are you figuring out if there's three people in the car? Right now they're using the honor system. They give you a transponder that can go z one, two, or three. Uh, eventually there's going to be technology that, de that uh, detects the occupancy of the vehicle. And it's just not, there's companies trying to do it. It's just not accurate enough to be able to enforce yet. They will tell you it's accurate enough to enforce, but it's not accurate enough to enforce. It can't be 94% accurate and be able to enforce that and collect a toll on it. It's got to be 99.9%. .9%. So these are the types of things that are that uh, uh, three different scenarios that we're dealing with today um, where technology is going to help us solve mobility problems. Uh, and I think uh, you've probably heard over and over and over again about uh, the opportunity for all this technology to... Um, improve safety, um, and I wholeheartedly uh, endorse that um, and reinforce that. But uh, these are these are some real time situations that we're trying to talk about today. So, in summary, let me uh, uh, wrap up the, this way these fine points, and then uh, that'll give us an opportunity to uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Try to answer any questions that you may have. Is Look, it's right in front of us now, and, and the, uh, the deployment of this technology and the utilization of this technology is happening right now in some major cities, uh, and then in, state, uh, in different state DOTs, they're trying to deploy it uh, in different forms and fashion, and cities and, and DOTs um, are trying to learn from it, uh, learn from each other and advance it. Uh, it's going to be a messy transition, in my opinion. It's got to kind of get uh, 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 bumpers to it, as I say, and it's got to be steered a little bit. Um, so that we realize our intended uh, goals and not our unintended uh, consequences, some of those that I touched on. Um, the, the, the technology is here, so uh, deploy it where you... Uh, y we, we need to jump as owner-operators um, because uh, if we wait for all the vehicles to have the technology before we put it in the infrastructure, then we're going to be waiting for some time. But if we deploy it in the infrastructure, it's going to instigate companies like Ford and Toyota and others to make that commitment and start putting the technology in their cars um, and moving forward. So from a policy standpoint, uh, I, would, I would encourage people to move forward and deploy the technology. And people like Randy Iwasaki and some of the others that you heard from, Greg Winfrey, they're doing the research to advance the capabilities of that technology, and that's just going to accelerate. 
So the, the, the realm of possibility is just going to be increasing. So my, my, my last uh, advice to everybody is just go ahead and jump and pull the trigger and deploy the technology and see what its capabilities are. But the safety uh, applications are, are, are right around the corner and, and can be employed now. So with that, I'll take a breath and I'll look around the room and see if you have any questions on any of the things that I talked about, any questions on something that I did not necessarily touch on, or you can, I'll even try to field some questions about something somebody else might have said. <coughs> Here comes the mic. I jumped into the question. They weren't ready. Okay. If you talk without a mic. Right. Is this thing on again? <laughs> Purely speculative question. Um, you, a few minutes ago, you talked about uh, FCC licensing and how CV2X wants to infringe on the 5.9 uh, spectrum that's uh, currently allocated to DSRC. And we've been hearing about this tug of war conflict uh, of retaining the, the 5.9 uh, spectrum to, for DSRC. What happens to the agencies? What happens to those licenses that already exist? Uh, because I've done FCC licensing in, in, in my previous world for a small city. Uh, um, it, not a hard process, you, uh, uh, but you do have to break into specifics of what channels you're going to use where, or you just check all the boxes. But uh, but uh, if FCC says, okay, we're taking these, uh, we're taking half the spectrum away, what happens to the legacy licenses? Do we have a precedent on uh, what to expect from from previous uh, policy shifts? Um, like I said, speculative. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I can make this up. The um the bandwidth of 5.9 gigahertz is currently committed to DSRC, all seven channels. Uh, now there's a waiver request for uh, CV to X, uh, the 5G as they refer to it, to come in and use the top two channels. Um, <clears throat> a, the, that waiver is under petition now. They're looking for as many people to sign on to that and support that waiver request uh, a, as they can get. This was a, I will call it a heated discussion at the last ITS America board member yeah. because Qualcomm, Ford, and Toyota are all on the board of directors. Now they were all professional, they were all polite, but they have different interests coming to this conversation. The first thing that I think, as a, a, the first thing we need to do is all rally behind protecting that bandwidth for this use and represent the safety or the safety benefits that will be realized once we figure it out. Because the telecom folks want to use this bandwidth for infotainment. They want to use it for something else. If we lose that band for vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure and V to X period communication, then we've got a problem. All the promise that I've been talking about and everybody else has been talking about, then we don't have that bandwidth period. So the first thing we need to do is to protect it. If they grant that waiver, what will happen is you'll end up with CV to X, 5G in the top two channels. DSRC is using in different areas all seven channels now. I know in Utah, UDOT is using all seven channels. Presumably, they would have to back off and go down to the bottom four channels. Now you're getting beyond my technical knowledge, but they actually talk about bleed over and interference between the two of them. So maybe there's a buffer channel. I don't know. But at least then both technologies are being deployed and being utilized and being advanced and hopefully the market figures out what the functionality of them is and which one wins. But the DSRC folks are already feeling like that's the first brick of them getting muscled out. The 5G folks have already said, well, yeah, as soon as we get the top two channels, we're going to ask for the next four. But uh, not only are they arguing amongst themselves, but the telecom folks are arguing, we just want the whole bandwidth for entertainment. Right, so both those dynamics are going on. Right. ITS America did not, because they all came and basically said, hey, look, we, we pay a lot of money to be a member of this organization. We're on the executive board, uh, and we want you to support this waiver, and if not, we're out. Not quite. I mean, it was almost like that. But then you've got the other folks, the DSRC folks, are also on the board, and they're deploying it. So we've got to figure it out, but in my opinion, the technology, both technologies need to advance. Today, the, the challenge is DSRC today it, it works. I, I, it works. You can deploy it. It'll do what you need it to do, and it's highly reliable. The 5G stuff's not ready for deployment. It may end up being the ultimate answer down the line. I actually think there's going to be a place for both technologies, which creates some other technical challenges because then your car needs to talk to both. That 5G 
it's, there's going to be a lot of information that's perfectly appropriate to transmit to the vehicle in 5G. But is that going to have the latency and not have the interference when you have a split second decision to make or even a fraction of a second decision to make, not you, your car, in a collision avoidance situation at an intersection? I know DSRC can do that today. 5G, there's going to be so much information going through there. Is that information going to have a priority? Is this car going to talk to that car as they're moving uh, you know, perpendicular to each other at 30 miles an hour and, and take over and avoid that collision? I, I, eventually, I would presume it would have that capability, but, but today it doesn't. It's very interesting that you said the uh, top two channels are, are being shopped by CV2X uh, off the DSRC, out of the DSRC shopping cart. I remember reading, uh, thoroughly reading the FCC requirements on, on what each channel is supposed to be for. By the way, I have not thoroughly read the uh, FCC and, requirements. And, and well, <laughs> well, well something, something you said that's triggering me is, uh, is that, uh, and I can't remember where on the spectrum, but two of those channels are reserved for emergency, uh, police vehicles, emergency that's services. Correct. So I'd be interested to see if they're looking at, at, at those channels that, that have different power requirements and everything else, and that, that would correct. be... Um, that 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 might kind of show what they're what they're going for, but um, to me it seems like it's obvious that the, uh, the FCC would have a hard time giving away um, uh, 5.9 from either DSRC or CV2X and giving it to Comcast if um, if more agencies just applied for licenses to, uh, for use in the future. Yeah, it's, so the FCC is leaning towards giving it to. The, the telecom business. Licenses are free to public uh, agencies. <laughs> they, they are. And, and their argument, part of their argument is, the CAV industry keeps talking about it. They're not using it. They've got 100 pilots. You know, they're not using that band. We're going to deploy it and use it for, for, for uh, telecom to millions and millions of people. I mean, that is their argument. So it, it just, it just between the two of us, it, it, it more clearly identifies the tug of war that's going on. What my interest as a transportation professional is, look, so many accidents and injuries and fatalities happen at intersections, right? Because people are either inattentive or whatever variables there are. And imagine if not only your car knew what color the, the light was reliably through technology of communication, not necessarily having to read the green, yellow, or red light. Your car is not going to run that red light. It's going to warn you you're going way too fast approaching this red light. And then eventually when you don't do anything, it's going to stop before you run through that red light. Or it can detect if somebody else is going to run that red light. And, you know, and there's other convenience factors that you can sell to the consumer because your car will know the timing of the signal. It will know the timing of the next six signals. Every morning will be the morning you caught every green light on your way to work. So there's a, the technology needs to get there, but uh, we need to protect it for this. Um, DSRC uh, 5G, I don't have a dog in the fight. I just want to make sure we protect it, and whichever one is the better, has the better functionality and the safety aspect advances. It definitely isn't going to help us if uh, 5.9 is being piped through a fiber or through a cable line um, in, in a closed-loop network later yeah. on. We can't, we can't use it then. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? <laughs> sure. One question. Um, so we had a speaker yesterday that uh, about micromobility and um, and uh, just basically about the rise of it. But I also know there's policy impact, and I know Los Angeles was doing some things with the uh, scooter manufacturers. But from your perspective, what have you seen in terms of policy discussions? Uh, people are looking at the the small shared electrics as opposed to Uber and Lyft. So the the micromobility is 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 absolutely a trend. Um, there's going to be a lot of players in it. In the early aspects of it, probably too many players, right? When I was in Austin, Texas, man, I think there were three bike shares and four different scooter companies. And excuse my French, but the shit was everywhere. <laughs> and they just, I mean, it's just everywhere, the different scooters. Uh, but if you, I mean, some cities are just saying, come in and compete, and the winner has access to the city. Um, in my opinion, it, it's a free market. Micromobility is going to be great for uh, transportation in the long run. I don't fault the companies at all for wanting to come in. The cities have got to figure their shit out. They've got to get their act together. They've got to pick the rules of the road and, and, and articulate those rules of the road. A couple examples. Uh, in Hawaii, when they wanted to deploy in Hawaii for a change, they went and talked to the Hawaii DOT and the cities as to, we'd like to do this right. 
Uh, and when I talked to them, they were like, we're, we're thinking about just considering them bikes. We'll give them the same rules as the, as the bikes. All right, so they're not on the sidewalks. They're in the bike lanes. That may sound like a good idea. But a bi if you, I mean, in Hawaii, the, the, the roads that go around the island, bikes are allowed on those roads. I said, do you want scooters on those roads? Absolutely not. I mean, a bike's allowed on any road with a speed limit of 35 or 45 or 50. Um, so then they're like, okay, we can't call them just bikes, right? But they're not pedestrians because you don't want them. So you're going to have to come up with rules of engagement. That's one example. Another example is, look, I'm not in favor of just leaving them wherever, you, wherever you're done. Um, Sacramento had a very good approach and said, look, you put your stuff away in this town. So they basically said, you can come into town, you can deploy, multiple companies deployed, but the rules were you had to put them away, and the designated places was you could put them at any bike rack, or you could put them at, when bird came in, they made designated parking areas and they called them bird nests. And if you use it, it's a dollar for the 30 minutes you use to go wherever. If you don't put it back in a, in a, in a location that was an approved location, they're going to charge you $5, right? So that's how they would enforce it. But the, the, the cities need to figure out how this needs to get deployed. I heard one city official, I, didn't, I read about it. He, he, uh, I don't remember what town it was in either. It was in Southern California. And a couple of, they just come in and they dump a bunch of scooters and then they ask the city to figure it out later. And one of the city officials says, that's it, we're bad. Them. They invaded us like cockroaches. In the, <laughs> I mean, you could picture all these scooters coming in. The cities have to figure out how to accommodate them, what are the rules of engagement, what are the rules of the road, make it an open competition, the different companies can come in, um, but just, just give them rules. And that's not, that's not the scooter company's responsibility, that's the city's. Um, the one thing I do know is we're not going to have sidewalks, bike lanes, and scooter lanes. Right? I just don't see that happening. So you're going to have to come up with a good infrastructure design to accommodate all of these different things. But it's coming, but just do it right. Give them, give them boundaries. Give them boundaries, give them lanes, you know, give them, I shouldn't use lanes, that's the wrong reference, but you know, give them bumpers. Tell them how, what the rules of the road are. Other questions? Are we good? All right. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it.